Actually, I hesitate to say, but I, I do also have a slide to share, to introduce you. I don't know whether you want me to do it or you just want no, to start. No, 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 no. You don't, don't want to. Don't, 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 don't fancy. Don't, don't do any elaborate <laughs> introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was really prepared yesterday. Anyway, maybe. All right, so then let's start. Uh, I do have a special slide, but I think Petra doesn't, doesn't want to see it. So. Uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to Harvard University Center for Mathematical Science and Application Quantum Matter Seminar Series. Um, we have a, a strong correlated uh, quantum materials and high DC superconductor series today. And we are very happy to uh, welcome Professor Patrick Lee uh, from MIT. Uh, he will be speaking about the not so normal, normal state of under the Cooper. Uh, I just wonder, say, uh, Zhao, Oh, sorry, this uh, this uh, Yahweh. Do you have additional thing you want to introduce, Patrick? Uh, maybe not. I think Patrick oh, no, okay. does not need any right. introduction. <laughs> okay, so Patrick doesn't need any introduction. So let's just welcome Patrick. Okay. Yeah. Uh, well, let me uh, first thank uh, uh, Juven for uh, uh, coming up with the idea of this series and uh, organizing it. Uh, I think it has worked out uh, amazingly well. We have uh, a number of uh, amazing speakers. Uh, Starting with uh, Subir and then uh, uh, Ina Bishik and then uh, Louis Taifair. Uh, and then I, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, excellent speakers coming up. So uh, uh, I think it really is very timely because um, uh, I think this field really needs uh, um, some, some focusing now uh, to try to uh, move it forward. Um, yeah, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, the uh, normal state of under the cuprates. Uh, the work is really um, um, the work. The new, the relatively new work I'll, I'll show is uh, really the work of uh, my, my former graduate students at Zhao Dai, who is now at Berkeley, and uh, and uh, at Center, who is my longtime uh, uh, friend and collaborator. Um, okay, so uh, let me start with a bit of introduction. Uh, why is this problem interesting, and why is it so tough? Right. So I, I think the problem we face is that uh, the, the, the material, the system is giving us a lot of mixed signatures, signals, and many dichotomies. Well, there, these have been well documented in the literature. Uh, okay, let me get my, my pointer. Okay, uh, there's a whole issue of anti-nodal versus nodal points, right? The anti-nodal is here, the nodal is here. Um, and the, uh, the first discovery <clears throat> of the pseudo-gap uh, uh, region uh, is a uh, large uh, uh, energy gap here, um, which is not a real gap, but uh, is kind of filled in, so it's called a pseudo-gap. And there's a so-called Fermi arc, which exists um, in near this uh, nodal region. Um, now there's also the issue of Lattinger volume, and this is a general problem of when you dope a mod insulator, and this is a problem that we've faced from day one, uh, very early on. Uh, in other words, uh, when you dope a mod insulator, the insulating state accommodate one electron per unit cell, right? Which is not allowed by band theory. Uh, so when you dope, uh, the first carriers presumably enter into a small pocket. And this is okay because uh, we have an anti ferromagnetic state. So your, your, your unit cell is, uh, is, uh, is expanded. Your gluon zone is uh, uh, shrunk to a half. And so this satisfies uh, your theorem with, uh, uh, with uh, P uh, states, um, right? Um, P is the number of holes. Uh, okay, on, on the other limit, when you put in a lot of holes, the system becomes a metal eventually. And on this side, uh, you expect that you should form a large Fermi surface. And then by Lattinger theorem, um, uh, you should, the volume should be one plus P. So the volume would be, would be the volume of this uh, uh, whole pocket, right? Um, so basically the local moment 
that was responsible for the button insulator is now completely free to become part of the Fermi surface. Okay. And so how does this transition happen? Right, so that, that's uh, obviously a highly non-trivial uh, problem. And nature have chosen to do this in, a, uh, in an amazing way. Well, first is that it uh, solves a problem by, by punting, namely it becomes a superconductor. So you cannot even ask this question uh, in between. Uh, the second it, thing it does is that if you manage to kill the superconductor with a high magnetic field, then you go through a series of very interesting uh, states. And so I think this is the main uh, issue that we want to uh, address today. And that, that's a, a main puzzle uh, and, uh, of, of great interest. And along the way, um, uh, this problem in this pseudo phase has a lot of instabilities. There's charge ordering, there's pneumaticity, there's possibly uh, orbital currents with time reversal and inversion uh, breaking. So the question is that, is there a main actor behind this uh, whole scene? Or are these just uh, competing states that everybody is uh, more or less equal? And this is sometimes referred to as intertwined order. So there are many different, again, uh, dichotomies that faces us. Uh, finally, another dichotomy is the following. Uh, the question is, how strong are the pair fluctuations about TC? So we know that this is a D-wave superconductor. Well, many experiments uh, would say that, well, you know, this is high TC, correlation length is short, but still, um, some lightning fluctuation lives only maybe 20, 30 Kelvin above TC, <clears throat> and it's relatively conventional, right? And that's mainly from transport. If you look at resist resistivity, it doesn't really do much. Uh, you don't see large um, fluctuation in conductivity above TC and so on. On the other hand, there are experiments that have shown that there is actually a very robust pairing, much above TC, up to uh, maybe 200 Kelvin, and, uh, and also, um, uh, what much about HC2. So um, another feature of the pseudo gap state is that it can be killed by a relatively small magnetic field. So HC2 is very small, <clears throat> maybe 22 Tesla. Um, and, um, but uh, there are indications that uh, actually there's a lot of pairing um, in this region. And it, the, the evidence comes from, uh, um, interlayer Josephson plasma. Um, for example, in the YBCO, there are, there are bilayers, and <clears throat> there's evidence that up to 180 Kelvin, you can see something like a Josephson plasma uh, uh, oscillation uh, in these bilayers. And that's possible only if you're pairing. Um, uh, Fan Ong and his group have long argued uh, for large diamagnetism uh, in, so, in this whole region. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'll show you some new data on, uh, on pairing. Uh, there's some evidence for superconductivity um, for magnetic field much higher than HC2. So, so this is another uh, issue that we face. Um, is this region uh, characterized by uh, very strong pairing fluctuation or not? Okay. And um, okay, right. So I think the basic question that we first have to face is that what is the origin of this pseudo gap? I mean, that, that is the most spectacular uh, thing that uh, opened up this field in the first place. Well, um, in condensed matter physics, I, I know only of two common mechanisms for gap opening in, in the metal. Yeah. One is if you um, uh, break translational symmetry and have some uh, <clears throat> finite Q orders such as sharp density wave or spin density wave, then you can gap out the uh, open up gap at the, at the, uh, the reduced gluon zone edge. The, the second method uh, is that uh, if you don't want to double, uh, if you don't want to introduce finite Q, you can have pairing. Pairing uh, BCS uh, shows us how you open gap at the Fermi level. Um, okay, so then we are faced with a question is the pseudo gap um, uh, uh, due to this kind of order or due to pairing? Well, I would argue that uh, if it is due to charge order, and we have direct evidence of charge order here, that this is unlikely. Uh, this is unlikely origin of a uh, pseudo gap. Uh, I will explain that in, in the next uh, few slides later. So I think we're left with the option, uh, unless you want to be totally exotic, um, is that pairing is somehow responsible for this uh, pseudo gap. Uh, 
then the, the remain, main question is that what kind of pairing is it, right? So obviously it would be, it's zero gap means that it's not ordered, so it's fluctuating. So is it a D-wave pairing? Somehow this, this kind of uh, fluctuation extends up to, you know, hundreds of Kelvin, or is it some other kind of pairing? Okay, so I think uh, those are the options that are open to us if we want to be relatively conservative, okay? So actually one of the theme I want to say is that uh, even though this ideas I'm going to propose to you sounds kind of crazy, it is actually the most conservative view uh, uh, that uh, I can come up with. Okay, right. So this really gives us the, uh, the feeling that there's an elephant in the room that we're not seeing. Now this, I think this is the crux of the problem, okay? And you know, what we're seeing is we're seeing stripes uh, and we're seeing Fermi arc, right? We're seeing D, D wave conducts, super, superconductor, but somehow we're not seeing the element, okay? And so today I'm, I'm gonna make a proposal for what the element is. Um, you can either like it or not. Uh, but I think the bigger idea that there's an elephant missing, uh, I think it, I, I feel very strong about that. Um, um, right, so, so that, you know, after 30 years, uh, somehow we're missing the biggest uh, uh, guy in the problem. And this is a very embarrassing situation. Okay, so uh, I, I started this uh, in six years ago and I was really motivated by some uh, uh, office data from uh, um, CX, uh, Shams Group. Um, on the single layer visco, which I'll show you a little uh, details that go along. And single layer visco is unusual because there apparently is a rather clean uh, uh, onset of the pseudo gap. And furthermore, it's a separated uh, cleanly from the sumonductor. The sumonductor in this system, for some reason, is enormously low temperature, it's only up to, up to 30 Kelvin or so. And the pseudo gap goes up to 180 Kelvin or so. So this makes it an ideal system to make a detailed study. Um, so I'm, I'm going to show you that uh, the phenomenologically, uh, this uh, simple model can accommodate a lot of the dichotomies. Uh, it naturally has a pseudo gap because it has a pairing. So in this picture, the pseudo gap comes from uh, a pairing. So pair density wave is of, uh, of course a pairing at finite momentum, but the unusual thing about uh, pair density wave is that naturally it leaves part of the Fermi surface ungapped. So it immediately gives you these uh, pseudo uh, Fermi arc. And uh, a consequence of this is that you can naturally uh, explain a lot of the instabilities uh, such as charge density wave or pneumat pneumaticity as a composite order uh, based on this uh, fundamental order. So the idea is that there's one fundamental order, which I uh, call the mother state, uh, which is fluctuating. But out of this fluctuating mother state, it can actually create daughter states that are ordered. And that could be the origin of many instabilities. So this is distinct from this intertwined order idea um, that uh, these, these are, so the idea is that these, uh, these orders that we see, the things that we see are actually just um, tip of the iceberg, if you like. Uh, that nature is uh, kind enough to show us. Um, right, okay. And so also, because now we have two kinds of superconductors, it, it naturally accommodates the idea that you can have strong pair density wave fluctuation, but relatively weak uh, D wave superconductor fluctuation. Okay. Um, uh, a bunch of us wrote a review on general issue of pair density wave that some of you might uh, find it useful. And uh, today's talk, uh, so this is, uh, it's been going on for several years. So I will go over uh, um, his reasoning, uh, but I would like to talk about some uh, recent things that we've done in the last couple of years. Uh, and that is that uh, we try to focus on discussing the ground state um, of the inner pseudo gap. You see, one reason the pseudo gap problem is so difficult to discuss is that you know, a lot of the phenomenology happens at finite temperature. And so it's not easy to think about thermal fluctuations and, you know, there's no, it's difficult to make sharp statements at, at finite temperature. But if you can kill the superconductor, 
uh, with a magnetic field, then you expose the true normal state. And uh, so we can ask the question, how do we describe the ground state, the true ground state property uh, of the system? Okay. And there's a paper by, uh, by the Hal Dai that uh, I think recently came out in Jitra B. And finally, I want to um, uh, discuss a proposal that I made uh, a couple of years ago uh, that, that uh, proposed an experiment that I believe can directly test whether these patterns of wave fluctuations are, uh, exist or not. It's a very direct probe. Uh, so we can, should, in principle, it should be answered, should, uh, should be able to answer this question once and for all. Right. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> so before I launch the uh, main part of the talk, let me step back and sort of give a, a big picture uh, of what this thing is. So this is the, uh, the phase diagram I stole from uh, Louis Taipei's uh, uh, review article. Uh, again, anti-ferromagnet, a, a pseudo gap, uh, Sumanatya and some uh, charge density wave. Okay, and <clears throat> um, so the big picture, uh, that at least that that uh, driven my way of thinking uh, over the last uh, thirty years, uh, of course, starts with Phil Anderson's uh, remarkable RVB uh, uh, paper, um, and which was followed by a mean field uh, form formulation of these ideas. Uh, uh, discuss the fractionalization of electron into spin-ons and holons. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the mean field theory there was not done correctly. And that was uh, uh, fixed by Kotli and Liu um, um, a year later, uh, who came up with a, uh, the, uh, the correct mean field phase diagram. And the mean field phase diagram looks like this. Um, as a function of temperature and doping, um, there is a, a line which indicates that the spin-ons, uh, so in this picture, um, the, your fractionalization into uh, uh, spin-ons, which is half filled, and then uh, the charge is carried by holons, which is, uh, has P of them, right, uh, which is positive, which carries the charge. So uh, in this picture, uh, the spin-on Fermi surface is actually unstable, and uh, it uh, forms a D-wave pairing, uh, and, the, and the temperature scale goes down like this, okay. Now the bosons, um, of course, like to bose condense. Uh, um, it's very hard for them not to, and they would bose condense below this this line. Okay, so this naturally gives you a, a three different phases. Uh, in the overdope region, uh, this becomes a Fermi liquid because uh, this is just a spin-on uh, uh, Fermi surface that has become. I'm sorry, I, I misspoke. The, the spin-on is uh, has 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 volume as a as a Lunger volume one, one plus P. So the spin on um, becomes a Fermi liquid because they uh, becomes a true electron, okay? And here um, you have um, the, the spin on pairing becomes true electron pairing. So this is a physical D wave superconductor. But in this phase diagram, there's a uh, interesting corner here, which where the spin ons are paired so you have a gap in the spin excitation. Uh, and so this very anomalous region uh, actually predicted the existence of a pseudo gap phase. So I would say, and this is very early on, this is before any experiment saw these uh, pseudo gap. Uh, I think the pseudo gap was first seen in 89 or 90 uh, uh, along here. Um, so the pseudo gap was actually predicted by the RBB theory. So uh, we should really view this as a great triumph. Um, um, and in this picture, the pseudo gap is really a spin gap. And, and it is a way of describing, uh, of course, what's missing here is the anti magnet and the anti magnet we understand, we think we understand everything. But so this idea is that the, the, uh, the whole, the dope hole is ordered the uh, anti magnet. And, and um, what remains is that the, the the um, triplet excitations are mainly gapped. It's actually gapless at the nodal point, but it's mainly gapped. And that big gap is described by a pairing of spin on. Um, and, and eventually that pairing becomes a, a supermetric. So this is all a very beautiful uh, um, uh, uh, picture. And uh, a lot of it is actually uh, verified uh, in subsequent work, I believe. Now, why does this thing not 
uh, well, of course, this picture got a lot of resistance over many years. Um, and it's a very difficult uh, problem to, to really turn this into a quantitative theory. I think uh, the main problem is that a boson with finite density is very difficult to treat. They basically want the both condensed. And uh, so I think our understanding now is that this spin charge separation uh, uh, picture really fails at low temperature. The low temperature states are all conventional. And this is actually um, the prediction of this theory. The low temperature state are boring, is a Fermi liquid or a superconductor. Um, and if there's some indications of spin charge separation, uh, it would happen at intermediate temperature um, uh, somewhere. Um, uh, up here, maybe. So maybe up here there's some signs of spin-ons and, and holons. But uh, now, but then this uh, this transition uh, from uh, uh, exotic physics to boring physics uh, is something we may call confinement, and that's just something that we don't we simply don't have the theoretical tools to to study uh, properly. So I think this is why it is hard to bridge the gap between this. So a qualitative picture and a more quantitative picture that we yeah, we want over here. So to circumvent this, uh, now what we want to do is to focus on the low energy physics. Um, so we, in the low energy physics, I think it's safe to assume that the spinons and holons are, are recombined, and we can talk about electrons forming a D wave superconductor or from liquid or charge density wave, and try to understand the ground state um, uh, before we venture into these more difficult uh, uh, problem. But deep down, at least in my mind, uh, I really think of the antinodal gap as a spin on pairing gap that uh, um, evolves from disordering the, the anti fermi state. So this, the, this pair density wave way of viewing this uh, pseudo gap is really a uh, uh, poor man's way of uh, discussing, uh, bringing that back this uh, spin on physics. At least that's what motivated my, in the back of my mind. Uh, by the way, um, I think I, I would love to hear people's um, uh, questions and comments as I go along, actually. I, I cannot see any uh, information about people you know, wanting to interrupt and so on, but uh, feel free, free to interrupt. Um. <clears throat> okay. Right. So um, let me make uh, one further comment, uh, general comment particularly in view of what uh, was discussed uh, uh, last time, because uh, last time um, uh, um, Louis uh, paid a lot of attention to this transition between the, um, um, between the Fermi liquid state and the, and, and the pseudo gap state, okay? I don't have too much to say about this point uh, today, but let me just make a few general comments. Uh, so first of all, uh, the, the the picture is the following, right? So we have this endothermic state. Now this state is well understood because uh, this would just form uh, small pockets, right? Over here, we have a Fermi liquid state that uh, has large Fermi surface. I just want to remind uh, people that this Fermi liquid state is actually not completely trivial because it remembers that it, it has its origin in uh, doping of a mod insulator. Okay, so it remembers that uh, the charge is carried by P uh, um, uh, holons. Okay, and this is something that we already pointed out uh, uh, 30 years ago. Namely, the conductivity, uh, even in a Fermi liquid state, is proportional to the doping concentration, P. But the Hall effect, the Hall number, is 1 plus P. Now, how does it manage to do that? Okay. Um, uh, it comes out of this um, of this uh, mean field theory that I uh, sketched on the last page, but it's actually consistent with Fermi liquid theory. You see, Fermi uh, Lando is very clever. He he has a Fermi liquid parameter for everything that he can measure, right? so he's always correct. So uh, in this case, there's a Fermi liquid parameter that connects the current with the velocity. So in free fermion, the current is just the electric charge times the uh, velocity, but uh, it is modified by this uh, Landau parameter. And the physics is that uh, since you shift, the fer uh, you shift the Fermi C, you distort it, as a, um, and the backflow, or the, or the shifted carriers can, can um, apply a force on the, on the, on the electron and, and push it further along. Okay, so that's a Landau parameter. So to interpret, to interpret this 
firm liquid in the Landau sense, what we say is that this Landau parameter happens to be P, okay? Then, uh, so this P is really a Landau parameter, okay? Now in firm liquid theory, then the conductivity is proportional to one uh, to this Landau parameter, which is exactly P. But the whole uh, uh, sigma xy uh, turns out to be proportional to this lambda parameter square. And that's because there are two factors of current and this is the whole expression, but only one in the conductivity expression. And now if you make the whole number, then this uh, lambda parameter just cancels, okay? So this is how in Landau firm liquid theory, it allows you to have a whole number, which is one plus P, but the transport is carried by uh, a P number of uh, uh, particles, a uh, charge, okay? And I believe that this is the case uh, here because, um, well, uh, certainly I think we, uh, we believe uh, and that, the, the, that the whole number is, is conventional uh, given by the, uh, uh, from the surface, uh, but the charge that should enter, the charge density should, that should enter the conductivity expression, I believe should be P, and it should vary smoothly uh, across here. Uh, you see, because in, as, um, as um, Louis showed you last time, the whole number seems to have some rapid change across here. So if you just use the whole number uh, to measure conductivity, then you would you have said that, well, the, the, the coefficient of the, uh, for example, the linear T term would change rapidly, but it's, it does not, okay? So I think it's more reasonable to think that this coefficient is really uh, uh, measured by P. Now, experimentally, of course, um, you can measure this directly um, um, by optical conductivity, for example, by measuring the spectral weight of the Judah peak. Or you can use the um, London penetration depth uh, which directly measures uh, this, uh, this what is called the, the spectral weight N over M uh, in a clean case, which I believe we mostly have uh, in this case. And I'm not sure how much data exists, but I think it will be very worthwhile for people to go back and uh, to check that this uh, optical sum rule, the, the sum rule of the conductivity for the Drew peak, Drew the peak is really smoothly continuing uh, in this whole region and is uh, given by P, okay? Um, and I want to mention this because I think the use of this uh, density also impact on the attempts to extract these uh, a scattering rate from uh, using signal T as, uh, as uh, Louis uh, showed you last time, uh, this so-called Planckian um, coefficient and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, the, the, this, this uh, question um, um, uh, requires some, some more uh, thinking. Okay. Patrick, Good. Patrick, sorry. Is there a crossover at higher doping like the Fermi liquid regime in Sigma? I'm sorry, there's a crossover in, in as sigma? a function of doping? Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is that the Fermi liquid starts beyond some P star. I think that that's the, what we have. Uh, but is uh, Sigma always P or? Yes. Go the Sigma one? should always be proportional to P, yeah. <laughs> So you, yeah. you believe in the strange metal region, if you m integrate the over the over the frequency dependent conductivity, it'll give you a factor P. Yes. Now, of course, you have to you have to know how far to integrate. So I would integrate um, just just the Judah peak. If you only integrate the Judah peak, I believe this uh, this spectral weight should be P. Supposed to integrate up to where the frequency dependence is similar since there is no due to peak. I mean, it's going as one over omega. Yeah, so then it's a, it's a question of where do you stop, right? So, <laughs> yes, yeah. So yeah, a, uh, a Landau theory is only a low energy theory. So I think I think the appropriate thing is to integrate up to the uh, due to peak. But or, in, in other words, uh, what you should ask is that, uh, you know, suppose you want to write a DC conductivity, the optical conductivity directly give you the tau, right? Okay. And so you should just uh, divide your measure DC conductivity by tau, and that is the P over M. That's what I can say. I wanted and, to say that the sum rule is not low energy theory. Yeah, yeah. I'm not using sum rule. I'm, I'm, this, this, is, this is thermal liquid theory, so I'm not using sum rule. Okay. 
let me let me say this again. Uh, so the the um, I can I have this fancy thing. I can I can draw a picture. Okay. Hmm. I'm trying to be fancy here. Oops. Well, um, hold on. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I kind of draw a picture. Yeah, so what, what Chandra is saying is this, right? Suppose we look at sigma of omega. Can you see my cursor? Let me go back to my, uh, my laser pointer. Okay, so suppose I have, um, let me make one more attempt. Yeah. Last time in practice, you did it, you, you were able to draw. Yeah, but now I cannot. Yeah. Okay, so let me just draw it in, in, in thin air, right? So this, this is a, a conductivity versus frequency. So the kind of sigma of omega looks like a Judah peak down here, and then there's a long tail, right? So Chandra is saying, how far should you integrate? So what I'm saying is that uh, there's a well-defined width of the Judah peak, which is one over tau, which is kT. Yeah, and actually empirically it's very close to 2kT in the data, one or 2kT when I when I look at the data, right? So I'm saying that as far as the Landau is concerned, um, the 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 uh, n over m is just whichever area in the Judah peak, right? Because uh, um, uh, to get n over m, you just take the DC conductivity and and divide by the tau, and then, and that would that's what we mean, okay? Um, so it has nothing to do with the uh, optical sum rule. The sum rule is something else. Okay, the sum rule may, probably will give you one plus p. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. Does that is that okay? Yeah, it's your show, Patrick. Go on. Hmm? I'm sorry. I said it is your show, so go on. Oh, okay. All right. No, I, I, you don't have to endorse this. Fine. I just want to make sure that you're, yeah, okay. So let me go on. Um, right, okay, so so that, that's the point I want to make. Okay, right, so I think, so this region, we I think we can maybe understand, okay. Now down here, so what's the story? So this is the crux of the problem, okay. And now I want to say that this problem, this region I can further divide into two parts. One is that, there's a charge order at low temperature. Let me assume that there's a, a charge order. And, and then experimentally, we know that in high field, we have uh, small pockets. And I think currently the understanding, uh, the best picture that uh, we know is that due to Harrison and, uh, and uh, Sebastian, which is that you form small pocket, small pocket out of this Fermi arc uh, with the charge density wave you know, like this. Okay. Um, so, Right. Okay, so so this is a general question. How to satisfy Langer theorem in this region, P less than P star, okay? Um, so I think there are three ways. The first is the easy way, the poor man's way, and that is to break translation symmetry, just like here, right? In this region, we break translational symmetry. We have new period, and then we can um, um, use the Langer theorem in the reduced uh, Brillouin zone. And then we can see what whether we satisfy the interest theorem or not. And so this is actually the work that I would want to talk about, uh, the new work with, with uh, Dai uh, that uh, will work in this region. So later on, I'm going to focus on this region. Okay. Now this region, I will have uh, less to tell you about, but in this region, uh, there's no charge ordering. So now this is uh, really a tough problem. We have the phase issue. There's no unit cell doubling. What do you do with uh, Langer theorem? Okay, and then there are basically two ways, right? The first is to say that Langer theorem still works. Then there should be a volume of one plus P, right? right. Uh, now we know that there's a pseudo, uh, there's a uh, Fermi R. Um, then in order to satisfy Langer, there has to be a ghost, uh, what we go, maybe call a ghost Fermi weight, uh, ghost spectral weight in this dash line. The ghost just means that it's not visible by Alpers but it has to be there. The Fermi uh, uh, liquid uh, re requires that there's some excitation at the Fermi level. Uh, this. 
just somehow doesn't show up in RPEX. And this area is the, is the one plus P. So this is option one. A second option uh, is the so-called Fermi liquid star. In this option, um, you say that the Fermi liquid theory um, um, actually tells you that you have a volume of P, okay? The total volume. So I'm, I'm just drawing an arc, but the P is really refers to total volume. So this area uh, is actually P over H, okay? Because there are four pockets and each can accommodate two electrons, okay? So we talk about the uh, area of P over H uh, for this uh, thing. And uh, this is uh, um, uh, a paper by Santil, Boyta, and uh, uh, Zubir, such that uh, show, showed us how you can overcome all these proofs of Lattinger theorem. Uh, but in order to overcome these proofs, you need some exotic physics, such as topological order. So basically, you need some kind of uh, spin arms to coexist with this uh, uh, pockets of, of dope poles which are fermionic. Um, otherwise, you cannot satisfy that this theorem. So this is a little bit exotic, maybe more than a little bit. So they call it FL star, okay? But at the end of the day, this should behave just like any old Fermi uh, service, just that you can uh, violate like, the conventional like, the theorem without any unicell doubling. <clears throat> okay, so this uh, state has been uh, greatly developed by Yang Hui, uh, Zhang and uh, Subir, and Subir talked about this, so I'm not going to uh, elaborate on this, except to point out that uh, I think in both scenarios, we need some kind of uh, ghost, uh, right? Of course, the Fermi R cannot end in thin air, right? So we need to close it somehow. So your choice is basically to close it this way or close it this way, okay? We need some kind of ghost. Uh, now, the price you pay for closing it this way with this ghost is that this predicts that you are, if you make a sumonector, you have eight nodes. This, this backside, even though it's invisible by Alpes, it is actually there in Fermi liquid theory as a quasi particle. And that it should contribute to specific heat and also to, to um, thermal conductivity and should be visible in, in these experiments. So if we want to take this point of view seriously, I think one has to uh, go, go to the experimentalist and ask, do we have evidence for eight nodes? Uh, how can we rule it out? So I think that's a, another uh, thing that would be very worthwhile to see. Of course, here we also need to have this, which in principle uh, also contributes to specific heat. Okay. All right. Okay, so th those are my general uh, remarks. And um, now I can go on to the main part, which uh, uh, actually can go by reasonably fast. As I mentioned, uh, I was inspired by these office experiment, Hey et al, uh, back in uh, 2011 on single layer uh, physical. Uh, and these papers found two unusual features from the office. Uh, one is that um, they compare, okay, so the good thing about this is that you can go at above the pseudo gap temperature, which is 170 degrees, and you can see a nice uh, uh, um, Fermi liquid, like you can see the band. So these traces are scanned. So this is our standard uh, Brouin zone. You make scans this way, right, like this, okay? And so this first scan is a scan right at the uh, zone core edge and then you progressively move in, right? As you move in, um, you expect that this uh, Fermi uh, pocket is gonna go sink deeper and deeper. And this is exactly what you see. So is that, is that clear now, right? So this is, this is clear. Now, if you go to a low temperature, uh, something remarkable happened to the spectrum. Uh, basically this thing disappears, but there's a huge gap that shows up right, right here, okay? Uh, and this is the pseudo gap, right? And, but the D wave pairing shows up somehow there's some spectral weight here and some spectral weight here. Okay. So, so this is what they see, yeah. right? Um, and um, so the two features uh, that they, they um, 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 pointed out is that this Fermi surface, uh, Fermi momentum is here and it doesn't line up with the top of the, uh, uh, Bogliubo band or, or the pseudo gap band. Yeah, they, they're very similar uh, here, okay, which they call G. Okay. And so they say that this is inconsistent 
with the pairing origin of the uh, pseudograph. Okay. The second point uh, is that if you look how this gap closes, you see, we, we, the claim is that in the pseudogap, there's this Fermi arc, right? That ends here, right? So the Fermi arc ending means that now states show up at the Fermi level. So we can ask, how does this happen, right? Okay. And now you can see it happening very graphically here in this, in this picture, because as you cut these slices, you can see that this gap progressively move up in energy, right? The gap shrinks from below and eventually it touches. So where it touches, this will be the end of the Fermi arc. And below, beyond here, this is your Fermi crossing, okay? So the, the Fermi arc appears uh, by state moving up from below uh, uh, the Fermi surface, okay? So it's moving up, okay? And this is my first point that this second observation is consistent, is inconsistent with a, any kind of uh, charge density wave or unicell doubling uh, kind of gap. And this I will show here in the next slide. Okay. And now if you want to um, impose a charge density wave, for example, this is the same thing. Sorry, I keep rotating <laughs> X and Y, but uh, I hope this is okay. So again, we make slices uh, in this way. And I assume that there is a, um, some kind of nesting that forms a charge order uh, like this. Okay, so this would be the location of the reduced gluon zone. And this is a standard way of zone voting that gives us the, the gap. So this will be charge density with gap, okay? Now, as we move in towards the zone center, this thing deepens and the gap is, is like this. And you can see that the gap is there. And of course the state uh, comes here. And in this picture, you also get a pseudo gap. So if you look at the Fermi level, you cannot distinguish between uh, uh, this kind of pairing or the um, uh, this, this pairing or the charge density wave because you in both cases you get a Fermi arc right and uh, and this is in fact the ghost uh, the ghost Fermi service right yeah. right um and the backside this will be the backside of this Fermi arc okay but now you can see that the way this gap closes is by a state coming from above okay and the gap is visible at the Fermi arc. So this makes a very clear prediction. At the end of the arc, if you look at the spectrum, you should see a gap, right? In RPS, you, RPS you can only see this. But this is con in con contradiction with the experiment, which shows that the state is moving up from below, okay? And I think this is a very general argument. And the, the problem is that any kind of uh, nesting or any kind of uh, finite Q order is fixed in momentum space. The gap is not moving. The location of the gap is moving. The states are moving. The band is moving. And that necessarily uh, means that um, this, if you want to, uh, a Fermi arc has to come from, 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 uh, from above. Okay? Right. And this is not the only experiment. Uh, actually earlier, there was already experiment uh, in 2008 and, and also, in, uh, on, on two layer visco, which clearly shows this arc uh, again uh, coming from below. So in this experiment, they actually make detailed cuts uh, along here. Uh, very interestingly, I think this experiment claims to see a bit of back bending um, at the end of the arc. Uh, but I think this is uh, just extrapolation. Uh, and um, so what they see is that uh, this thing comes in like this. So that they actually can see the top uh, uh, of the arc. Okay, so this clearly rules out this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, picture. Uh, by the way, I think it would be very interesting uh, for the experimentalists to go back. And I think this picture was a little controversial because it requires some kind of extrapolation to high temperature at that time, but maybe it's time to go back and see if one can uh, see evidence of this back bending uh, uh, more clearly. Okay, so at that point, um, the, the story is that there's no mean field theory that was considered at the point can explain the data. So I thought we need some radical idea. So the radical idea is to try uh, pairing on the same side of the Fermi surface. So again, to summarize, charge density wave doesn't work because the gap is moving from below. 
But pairing doesn't work, conventional pairing, because conventional pairing is always particle symmetric. And, um, and, and the top of the group of band would line up with the, with the Fermi energy. So the motivation uh, was really RVB inspired because earlier, uh, Santo and I uh, had the notion of a spin on in a, in, a, in a spin liquid. Uh, um, they, they attract, they interact by, uh, by gauge uh, fluctuation. And, um, and we propose that there's a possibility of uh, something which we call empyrean pairing, where the uh, spin ons are, are, uh, um, are paired by moving in the same direction. I call it empyrean because uh, I had to teach freshman physics at one point. And, uh, and um, Ampere's law says that wires that carry um, current uh, in parallel are attractive. Okay. And um, so, so here, the electrons moving in the same direction uh, create a magnetic field, uh, which is the gauge magnetic field. And this gives rise to attraction. The difference between, uh, between uh, our, our world is simply that in the uh, spin liquid world, the coupling to the gauge field is very strong. Um, fine structure constant is about a one. So the magnetic coupling is, is actually as strong as the electric coupling. So this gives rise to a strong attraction between spin, um, spin and moving in the, in the same direction. Okay, so let's think of this as some, uh, some motivation, but really I want to just proceed phenomenologically uh, from this point on and just see what happens. Okay, so the idea is that this is again our, our quadrant, uh, that is the top of the unit cell. And uh, so to do empyrean pairing, you have to pick a point. So unlike um, conventional pairing, uh, where you get what a full Fermi surface here, you pick a point, and this is a natural point. Let's pick this point. And so what you do is that you take, uh, you take a dumbbell and you find a state P and a state uh, the opposite to it, and, and you pair these states. Okay, so that's the difference between this and BCS pairing. BCS pairing, you pair this state and the one on the opposite side, right? Or, or you pair the, uh, the, 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 the time reverse state, so this is the, the other side, okay? Um, right, so you can see that these pairs, that sum of the momentum is, is twice this momentum, or 2kf. So this is a kind of 2kf pairing, so the momentum is 2kf. Well, you say, wow, 2kf is huge, it's this one. But actually, up to umklop, it is exactly uh, this spanning vector between the two. Right? So the momentum carried by this uh, pair density wave is actually the, the vector between this k and minus k. Okay, and we have one uh, with plus k and one minus k pairing from from the other side. You might say that oh, you have to pair electrons in a hole, so the electron outside the Fermi surface in the hole. Be both the phase space is very very small because you know these have to be both particles. So it can, we can pair only within some, some uh, temperature. So here we use the fact that the, that the uh, gauge fluctuation, the gauge uh, propagate is uh, very singular in the forward direction uh, to get around it. But anyway, um, forget about microscopic classification. Let me just assume that uh, there's such a thing as the pair density wave, okay. Now I want to say that of course pair density wave was now is, a, is an old concept that um, goes back to 1960, uh, Fudafero, Lakhinov, Shinnikov. Uh, but that usually have a relatively small uh, pairing momentum and there's still pairing states on opposite side of the Fermi surface. So this is uh, uh, quite uh, unusual. And uh, I'll show you uh, very quickly, uh, unlike BCS pairing, uh, generically, you only gap uh, the Fermi surface around this point that you pick. And this, so it naturally leaves behind a uh, Fermi arc. Okay. And uh, even in the high TC context, uh, the pair dense wave has been, uh, has a long history. It was first proposed by Himeda, Kato, and Ogata in 19, uh, 2002. And they did it in the context of a stripe picture. This is a famous picture from Tranquata's uh, uh, famous paper, where we have uh, um, spin ordering and then charge uh, stripes. And I think the picture is the following. Uh, you no, know, if you make a sumoductor, it may pay to make an anti-phase domain. So the, the sumoducting pair can be positive in this region, where it is a hole rich uh, in this region. So the, the amplitude is large, but 
Uh, there's a note here because in between, this is like an insulator. You don't want your superconductor to live there. So I think this is actually a microscopic uh, motivation for putting a zero in your pair, uh, in your D-wave pairing here. And then this gives rise to this pair density wave. So notice that this pair density wave has period, which is double the period of the charge order, right? So in this case, the charge order is 4A, the pair density wave period will be 8A, okay? And um, uh, subsequent to this proposal, um, uh, Trunquata's group has uh, done beautiful work on, on showing that there's a kind of a mysterious two-dimensional um, um, like superconductivity in, in this one version of the uh, LBCO um, that lives at a much higher TC. And he made a himself already and, and then uh, Berg at all pointed out that this could easily be explained by stacking of, uh, of these uh, dependency wave. Okay, so that's the uh, original history. I want to say that the patterns wave I'm considering, I think is a different beast uh, for the following reason. Um, now in this uh, 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 type, um, which is based on the stripe picture, the pairing period of the stripe is well known. It, it goes up with doping, right? Because it has to do with the, with the uh, amount of the uh, uh, holes. The, the, the less hole you have is further apart and then the period is going down. And eventually, eventually saturated at about uh, 8, 1, 8. Okay. However, experimentally, these charge density wave that we see today uh, for the high TC have the opposite trend. They always go down with doping. Okay. And they, they can be quite far from this one, one quarter. Sometimes it's one quarter, but in the case of YBCO, it's co closer to one third. Okay. And there's no spin order. The spin fluctuations are at, at a different momentum uh, than this momentum completely. And I'm al also mainly considering a bi-directional pair density wave where we are uh, going both direction. Um, it's not an absolute requirement, but it's uh, easy for me to think uh, because it, it has e easier to explore the consequences of that. And finally, uh, in our picture, this pair density wave lives at very high temperature. Uh, basically, uh, the pseudo gap scale, which is uh, 100 millivolts, so it's, it's hundreds of degrees Kelvin, whereas the uh, stripe picture really is a low temperature physics, uh, like 40 Kelvin uh, in, the, in, in the old days. I should uh, say that uh, there has been early suggestion that this stripe type patterns may, may be relevant to the pseudo gap by uh, Burke and all, and also by uh, um, uh, uh, Callan and, 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 and so on. Uh, in a magnetic field. And also there's a experimental paper by, by Juan Holmes uh, group. Okay, but uh, I guess prop maybe it's uh, okay for me to say that uh, I'm the one who stuck my neck out uh, the furthest uh, ready to be, to be chopped off. Okay, so uh, I want to next show that as phenomenology, uh, it can, uh, has a lot of success. It can explain the details of the outputs. It has the, Fermi arc and the and the anti-node gap. It can appear explain the appearance of the charge density wave and it can account for the uh, quantum oscillations or electron pockets. Okay, so let me go on. I'm watching my time. Okay, okay. Patrick, uh, yep. one question. Yep. Uh, just to clarify, uh, this pair density wave is supposed to occur below T star, starting commencing at T star, or oh, maybe even higher. Yeah, I. I not, um, yeah, I, I imagine, yeah, this is a, a little bit ambiguous. Yeah, I would imagine that actually the amplitude of it is even higher. So, of course, for me, um, it, it is uh, fluctuating, so there's no sharp onset. But let me say that it's even higher. So at T-star, something else happens. Okay, I, I'll, I'll get to it in a minute. Okay. But yeah, but, but yes, conceptually, let me say that it, let's say maybe 50% of our T-star. Or, you know, factor two about T star, something like that. All right. <clears throat> okay. So the first issue is the uh, lining up of the uh, Fermi pocket. So in conventional theory, you know, we know that if you have a Fermi C, the way you understand PCS gap is that you make a particle hole band, right? You flip it, and then you, this is a so called semiconductor picture of the Bouguer ball spectrum. And then this top of the gap is always lined up with the Fermi. Energy. Now, in the pair density wave, if I make the same cut here, 
with this cut. Uh, then I have my, my uh, original Fermi surface here. Okay. And my instruction is to invert it, to make the dash band, which is inverted. But then I have to shift it by this uh, momentum, right? Because I'm pairing with opposite momentum. So the corresponding picture here is actually this one and this one. Now, when I now gap it, then I get the end bonding and anti-bonding blue and green band. But now you can see that the top of the, the Bogolubov spectrum does not line up with the KF anymore, right? Because there's intrinsic particle asymmetry, unlike the BCF style. The problem when you have finite momentum pairing. Okay. So this qualitatively looks like this. Now, secondly, this immediately gives me the, the uh, Fermi arc because if I make a cut down here, right, then this thing goes down, right? The, 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 the band structure gets deeper from here. And now the pairing, if I make the same construction, the, the gap is actually up here. So again, very importantly, you know, in pairing, the gap moves with the, with the Fermi surface. With the, it, it does not stay in one place in momentum space. It moves around. And this is what allows you to have this, uh, uh, first of all, this, this, this is a Fermi arc. And this Fermi arc come, comes about by a state moving from below, right? from this moving down to that. Okay. And, and you can also see that this, of course, the Fermi arc cannot uh, terminate. And there's a backside to this, right? And this is a backside now, right? The, this, this back. But you see that the backside came from this folded this uh, thing, which is really hole-like, right? So this is electron-like and, and this is uh, hole-like. And uh, so this uh, is really invisible by Arpes, uh, this, this band below the Fermi surface, right? And so this is why it can be seen. And so if you look at the Fermi level, then you, you see this Fermi R. There's a little bit of back bending. You actually you can see that. And then eventually you don't see the backside. The backside actually looks like this. It's, uh, it looks like a sausage. It doesn't, it looks like a ellipse, but it looks like a sausage. But you can see some bending here. Now this could be relevant to, uh, I think uh, Louis discussed uh, last time, the uh, 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 AMRO, uh, uh, AM, anti, whatever, uh, magnetic resistance, MR, uh, ADMR. Uh, and that may be seeing some uh, back bending, but this theory can accommodate that. <clears throat> Uh, so this picture for simplicity is just for one dimensional, what unidirectional pair density wave. Uh, for bidirectional pair density wave, I can uh, uh, have an, a little more complicated. So uh, the spectrum may look a little bit better. But anyway, so this is the uh, first point. Patrick, if I can interrupt you for just one second. Yeah. Um, still, you said there is a band bending and there is a for second part of the Fermi surface, maybe with very small spectral weight. Yeah. In terms of Lattinger theorem, uh, what mm -hmm. uh, this order will give? Yeah. The area of the so, surface versus P. Right. Uh, yeah. So, of course, um, in, in mean field theory, this is a really a, a simulator, so that's not in your theorem. So, the question is if you disorder it, right? If you say this phase fluctuation, <clears throat> what does Lattinger theorem give, right? So, that's a very interesting question. And uh, I would say that the, that the, uh, was, was, uh, my guess is that this will give one plus p, okay? And that goes back to a paper Santo and I wrote uh, uh, about 10 years ago. We, we asked the question of a, con if you have a conventional S-wave superconductor, uh, suppose you disorder it, what happens at Lattinger theorem, right? Suppose you, uh, and what we found is that a state emerges inside a gap uh, in the Fermi level, and that, um, satisfy the Lundger theorem. So my guess is that in this, in this picture, um, if you disorder this, um, inside this gap, there would emerge some, some, some state, um, some spectral weight, so that the, the Lundger theorem would be this. And in this respect, it all goes into first scenarios that you showed out of two, right? This dashed yes. lines. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, so this is actually, I made a picture of this. Yeah, this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So this is my guess. We haven't worked this out for the pair density way, but it's my guess. Okay. Right. Okay. I would focus on this 
which you see satisfy Latinus. Again, this satisfies the convention of Latinus there. Okay, thank you for the question. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next issue is that we can actually, out of this, we can get the charge order for free. And the idea is the following. So this is the order parameter for the, for the, um, for the pairing. We have a plus and minus, a left going and right going pair density wave. So actually there are four of them if we have bi-directional, but it's not so important. Uh, now, if you look at this, then Landau theory allows you to write down this term, right? Where I can combine the, this one. And that couples to the charge order at 2Q. Okay, so Landau theory tells you that if you have this guy, if you have a pair density wave, necessarily, if this is ordered, necessarily you would generate a charge density wave at double D uh, uh, Q. Okay, right. So charge order emerges very naturally out of this uh, assumption. Now, the trick is that um, we want this to be disordered because we don't want to see this uh, soon after, right? We want it to be hidden. Uh, this elephant is not so easily visible. Uh, but it's still possible that these guys, even though these guys are uh, fluctuating strongly, phase fluctuating, this guy is ordered. So the picture is like this. So this, let's, let's say that this is a phase of uh, the plus Q. This is a phase of the minus Q. Each of them is fluctuating wildly, right? But the relative phase may be locked, right? And if in that case, then we have a disordered uh, pair density wave, but in ordered uh, charge order, charge density. Wave. So this is allowed, okay, right? And it's even allowed that uh, I could have a bi-directional uh, pair density wave that generates a unidirectional charge density wave. This is also allowed by Landau theory because that that depends on the interaction uh, Landau coupling between the charge density wave and in the two directions. Okay, so this possibility was actually already pointed out uh, even way before by Ackerberg and, and, and Sunato uh, in a very nice paper and also by uh, Berg a lot. Okay, now this also gives us the, uh, once you have this, question. I'm sorry, yeah. Hmm? One more question, Patrick. Yeah. Good. What, what is the parameter which makes the fluctuations so fantastically strong for the pair density wave? Yeah. So the fluctuation is controlled, is phase fluctuation. So it's controlled by this phase stiffness. Okay. So the, uh, the argument is that phase stiffness is very, very small for the, for the parents. It's just uh, very floppy. Okay. And, and why is that? Um, there's a lot of entropy you can gain um, by, by this, but um, allow me to wave my hands and just say that this is the case. It's just very floppy. It's much more floppy than the uh, than the uh, than the charge density, uh, than the uh, regular D wave. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I had an argument actually. <laughs> now, now that I remember. Yeah. So because the, the reason it's very floppy is is because of the Fermi arc. Because uh, this state has a residual uh, normal state, and therefore you know the, the superfluid density is the is the sum of the uh, 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 sum of the normal fluid, norm, uh, uh, superfluid minus the normal fluid. So in this case, we have a huge amount of normal fluid left, and therefore the stiffness is very small. Yeah. So that that that's actually I don't need to wave my hands. Ah, uh, there is a good answer. Okay. So we can also explain the the the, uh, the quantum oscillations, and this is uh, really. Uh, taking over the suggestion of Harrison and Sebastian. What they say is that, okay, we have this uh, Fermi C. Uh, so the electrons is moving like this, uh, moving along like this, right? But then it can uh, be scattered by the charge density wave Q and like this and like this, like this, like this, right? So it forms a, a pocket. The nice thing is that this gives you a nice electron-like pocket, which is what the left experiment sees. And the size is uh, about right. Um, as I'll, I'll show uh, later, okay. And there's evidence from specific heat. This is Rick's uh, high, high field specific heat. They see quantum oscillation. But the important thing is that from the size of the specific heat, they, can, they, they, they claim that you can have only one pocket. You, you can accommodate only one pocket, right? uh, Because you know the mass of the pocket. 
um, and, and that's that's the case. All right. Um, yeah. Now the only trouble with these Horizon and Sebastian proposal is that you know you can start with this Fermi arc. If you um, make this um, electron pocket generically, you would leave a whole pocket here, right? Because you only gap out uh, part of this. If the gap is too big, um, you may wipe out this thing. So it's you know it's very hard to get rid of rid of this uh, um, uh, the states here. But of course, we already gotten rid of this, right? We have a pseudo gap. So if, if I start out with a fluctuating pair density wave, then I can easily argue that the charge density wave would uh, would uh, give rise to this pocket. And indeed, a simple mean field calculation gives us exactly that. So we can have a situation where we just have um, small pockets left. This is a large Bruin zone, a small Bruin zone. And this can be the origin of the uh, quantum oscillations. Okay. Right. So, yeah. So a few years ago, I think this point of view received some support. Um, I was uh, very happy to see this uh, by SDM from uh, Seamus Davis Group. Uh, they found evidence of, uh, of of a new charge order, which is at half the period, uh, half the momentum of the original charge density wave that has been studied. And this, they see this only near the vortex core. So they apply a large magnetic field. And in the space between the uh, vortex core, uh, they found this. So by, this is a Fourier transform. So uh, in, uh, in, this is two layer, uh, Bisco. Um, the charge sensor wave is well established at one quarter uh, wave vector, which is here. But they saw an additional peak at exactly half of this and both on, on, on both sides. Okay, so now you're faced with two choices. The first is that the original Q charge order is not fundamental. There's another uh, uh, order which is more fundamental and that somehow creates the, the one that we saw ordinarily is actually only a uh, harmonic of, the, of this more fundamental one. That's not very appetizing, I think. Now, the pair density wave immediately gives you that explanation because Remember, the pair density wave order we have is exactly half of the charge density wave order, right? By the lambda argument before. So if you somehow manage to stabilize this pair uh, density wave in the vicinity of the vortex core, then again, by lambda theory, uh, uh, since we already have a Q equal to zero D wave component there, then we can construct a charge density wave of half period. Okay, so, um, so even though they don't directly see the pair density wave at half period, uh, this suggests that this uh, may be a very good uh, reasonable explanation of it. I should caution that uh, this half period, half momentum, uh, so Q over two uh, has not been seen in YBCO uh, by scattering experiment, uh, despite uh, I think there's serious searches that uh, were taken. So, you know, I. Cannot claim total victory, but uh, I think this is uh, at least keep me going. So <clears throat> uh, there were a couple of theory work that try to uh, uh, explain this experiment. Uh, one um, from uh, Fred and Kibbelson and Wang, um, and the other from 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 our group. Uh, we have a slightly different take on this. I think uh, what they say is a uh, pair density wave with a competing order. They take a sigma model. So the, the patterns wave would uh, show up uh, um, uh, outside the um, uh, inside the vortex core, uh, where the these tensor is suppressed. We have our, uh, our picture is that the patterns wave is a mother state. It's a huge amplitude, as I said, uh, but it's strongly phase fluctuating because of the small uh, superfluid density. Then um, the question is that how do you manage to stabilize it? is always fluctuating. So how do you, but, but STM is a static measurement. So we need to be able to freeze this uh, pair density wave. And we came up, uh, as actually uh, the students came up with a mechanism where, you know, remember the pair density wave is, is a gradient of the phase, but around the vortex, there's actually a phase winding, which is uh, quite large. So if this phase winding happens to match the uh, gradient of the phase, this, this can pin the pair density wave into a static one. So in this region, which we call halo. Okay, so that, that's our picture. 
Okay, so this is a kind of a summary of our, our picture at this point. That the parent's wave has a large amplitude subject to strong phase fluctuation. And uh, so this is a phase diagram I sketched uh, in, uh, six years ago. Um, so uh, this is partly in answer to um, Chandra's question uh, before. Uh, it's a fuzzy region you know, with a very large uh, temperature range. The conventional deep wave simulator has small fluctuation, but this is a huge fluctuation of some hidden uh, pair dense wave order. At that time, I didn't know that the charge density wave uh, actually goes back down here, so I sketch it like this. Yeah. Now, it's also interesting to, to draw this in the TH plane, if you have apply magnetic field, and, and we'll come back to this uh, picture later. And you know, in that in that picture, conventional uh, uh, you have D wave going to uh, as PC, and you have uh, HC two. And the understanding is that this is a vortex solid phase, right? This is a pin vortex because you you can melt, you can uh, thermally melt melt this um, uh, vortex. Uh, so the fluctuating region here is should actually be considered you know, once you have a magnetic field would become a vortex liquid phase. Now, in our picture, again, this thing lives over a large region in temperature, but it should also live up to a very large magnetic field, uh, HC2. See, it actually is uh, mysterious why the HC2 for the uh, underdo Cooper is so small, 20 tesla, which is nothing, right, uh, on the scale of the uh, energy gap and, and everything else. And what it, what it requires is a very large <clears throat> vortex halo. Right, <clears throat> and in our picture, of course, the vortex halo is made up of this normal, this abnormal normal state, which is a fluctuating pair density wave. So in this region, <clears throat> the vortex halo overlap, <clears throat> and you really expose the pristine <clears throat> uh, pair density wave fluctuating state here. Okay, so this whole region is really should be thought of as a vortex liquid, but of a different type. Is a vortex liquid of a pair density wave. <clears throat> Okay, so in this picture, thermal activity is just an afterthought. <clears throat> it, it is just there to gap out the remaining uh, from, uh, from yak. <clears throat> now, what about the phase transition at T star? I think this is related to uh, Chandra's question. Now there's evidence that there's actually a phase transition. Well, Activer came up with an idea that um, <laughs> I think is very interesting. Uh, uh, let me just explain it. Uh, so I had uh, said that we want to pair at this point, right? Remember, we have a pick a pairing point for the pair density wave. So Actibus says, well, how about if we just shift this pairing point away from the from the zone boundary for whichever reason we're pairing here? And then this we can call this a canted pair density wave because the momentum is now uh, not facing each other, right? They're canted. Um, and this state turns out to breaks time reversal and inversion. And so it has exactly the same symmetry as uh, the orbital current state that Chandra liked uh, very much. Okay. And once you have this breaking of T and, and, um, and inversion, you can naturally have a pneumatic kind of uh, pair breaking, which can explain the observation of, um, of uh, thermodynamic uh, phase transition at T star. Okay. So again, in this picture, we require that this patterns were fluctuating even at higher temperature, but as some T star, uh, this pneumaticity uh, shows up. By the way, this canting does not affect the uh, pair uh, density momentum because it's still, it's going to be still not, the angle is not, uh, does not show up. Okay. Now we actually worked out the amount of orbital current. Uh, unfortunately in mean field theory, uh, the moment is very small, about 10 to the minus three ball meter. Again, this is a simple, we don't assume anything, just assume a pair density wave uh, that, is, that is canted, then automatically you would get uh, uh, orbital current. Okay, now this is much smaller than what is reported by uh, neutron scattering. Um, there's some controversy about the neutron scattering uh, experiment. And, but also, you know, this is mean field theory. So maybe, maybe it's bigger than, than we thought, who knows? Okay, but uh, this is my take on the, uh, on this uh, phase transition, T star. One question, Peter. Yeah. Uh, Patrick. Yeah. Uh, since we're using uh, Landau theory and constructing invariants, um, 
if you uh, accept the uh, experiment yeah. uh, with uh, 10 to the minus one Bohr magneton yeah. and just do Landau theory, is there any reason why one should not consider all the other effects that you are talking about as uh, uh, its uh, minor children? Oh, um, I, I, I'm not sure I can see. Um, um, I, I guess it's true that this magnetization density wave could uh, create charge density wave. Yeah, I think it's true. Yeah, uh, but the problem is that I don't see how you can get a gap. I mean, that, I, think, I, think, I think you would agree that's a, that's a basic problem with, uh, with this guy being primary. I, um, I, 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 I com completely agree with you on yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. So I think that would be my main uh, point. Uh, yeah. I, I hope to follow on your footsteps and talk about this in a few weeks. Okay. Meeting this, this issue. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so I, I yeah. So at least, uh, <laughs> right. So I think the issue is where does the gap comes from? Okay, so now, so finally, let me, um, um, I should uh, try to finish up in, uh, in about five minutes. So I want to address the question, what is the state if, the, the, uh, if, if I manage to kill this uh, D wave pairing, right? What is the state? We know there's this small, small per, per, uh, pockets. And so in this paper, we ask, you know, we had zero temperature, so we should be able to ask, this is a quantum state. So we should be able to ask, how do we describe this quantum state? What is the low energy theory of this quantum state? So again, we have strong phase fluctuation. So this is really a, uh, so the low energy physics, we say has fermions, has gapless fermions on the Fermi surface on this uh, uh, pocket, but it has to have some bosonic fluctuation, which is a pair fluctuation, uh, which we can think of uh, preformed pair, let's say that there are some charge two E boson around. Now, the problem, so this is a very difficult problem because we don't know how to treat bosons. Bosons are very tough to treat. They, they love to both condense and then, we, we, then we're in trouble. It turns out that uh, having a finite a momentum actually makes this problem tractable. You see, people have thought about, try to think about fluctuating D subnector. There was a paper of Balins and Nyack and so on, but it's difficult to make progress in this case. So let me explain why. Let's consider commensurate order, let's say period 3A or 4A, okay? Now this electron is from, from small Fermi pockets, right? Um, then there's some Lutzinger theorem that, that de determines the size. The remaining electrons, I would, we argue, form pairs, okay? And this pairs becomes a bosonic uh, object. But now the good thing about having a period is that you have an option. Generally speaking, if you have a boson system uh, and you want to disorder it, you don't have too many options. How do you destroy this, uh, this, this kind of disordered uh, boson? You have to gap it. Now, you can gap it uh, by disorder, which we don't like to do. Uh, we can localize it. We, there's, no, there's no localization here. Or they can form Wigner crystal. That's not pleasant either because that would give rise to periodicity. So, um, the, 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 now, but if you have a lattice, then you can form a mod insulator. So now we already have an, a lattice built in, right? Because we assume that the charge order is there. So we have a uh, uh, real one zone, and then we can, uh, this boson can form a mod insulator. So this is actually just a, cr uh, a, a crutch for us to, to argue that at the end of the day, uh, we have the spectrum that looks like this. We have fermion spectrum and a bosonic spectrum. Okay, so let me summarize it here. So the Fermi pockets form Fermi surface and the bosons are, uh, these are pairs of bosons, bosons made of electron pairs. So these are uh, uh, preformed pairs and they form a relativistic spectrum. Okay, because I can make pairs of, I, I can make electrons uh, pair or whole pairs, okay? And there's a gap. So we assume that the gap is relatively small, this uh, gap, maybe 10 or 20 uh, MeV. 
It turns out that this uh, picture has a number of interesting experimental consequences. Let me try to get through this uh, quickly. For ARPIS, for optical conductivity and diamagnetism. So first of all, for electron spectrum, the new feature is, is this. So we have a Fermi uh, fermion here, right? So what are the effects of the uh, bosons? Well, it turns out that you can make uh, electron and then you can make a bosonic particle pair. And then you have a spectrum like this. And it turns out that this tail goes as one over omega, which is very interesting. Now, on the other side, uh, so this is a picture when K is less than KF. So we see this, uh, ARPES would see this peak on this side. Now, uh, anti ARPES would see this, adding electron spectrum. I can add, instead of adding, <coughs> removing the electron, I can uh, add a bosonic pairs, which have two electrons and one hole. So this is a one electron spectrum. It turns out that it has a step and it's uh, basically flat. <clears throat> if you reverse this for K, uh, outside KF, then this picture just reverse. This uh, RPS peak is up here, which is not visible by RPS, but this guy should be down here. So we looked at the experimental spectrum uh, carefully, and this is something that was not noted, not noted before. So, you know, in the uh, uh, inside the Fermi uh, service, you see this uh, broad spectrum um, that people talked about and has a long tail. But if you look outside the Fermi surface, this is in a region where nothing happens. You see a step, okay? So we think this could be the step here. And this gap could be the boson gap, okay? Now, uh, this is, I think this is significant because if you go above T star, this step disappears, okay? So if this were due to some background, usually the background uh, would go up with increasing temperature or we reduce its temperature. So this step actually shows up at low temperature. So I think this is something that uh, is not trivial and maybe should be explained in uh, examined in greater detail. The second consequence that uh, was uh, interesting is that for a long time, it's known that optical conductivity, uh -huh, so this is what we were talking about earlier, has a Judah peak, right? And it's a long tail, which eventually uh, goes like one of omega and so on, okay? Um, now, for the boson picture, at finite frequency, we can make uh, particle excitation across the boson gap. <clears throat> so this conductivity give, turns out that it gives rise to a, to a feature like this. The interesting thing is that this is actually universal because the current operator is canceled by the density of states. So it predicts that the <clears throat> that there's an onset at, at, at twice the boson gap and it saturates to a constant value. And this constant value turns out to be pi over two e square over h. And amazingly, if we convert this uh, uh, number uh, to, to, to uh, this, uh, this is, is exactly pi square over e square over h per, per layer. Okay, so this is something that people have seen for many years, but nobody uh, seems to have noticed that this is actually a quantum of conductance out here. Okay, and it's naturally explained by this. So from this, we again infer that if this is twice the, if this onset is twice the boson gap, then maybe the boson gap is like you know, 20 millivolts. <clears throat> <clears throat> Finally, you can calculate the diamagnetism. To make a long story short, it goes like one of the, the boson gap, not surprisingly. Um, and, um, and, and the point is that this is much bigger than the typical fermionic uh, diamagnetism. Notice that diamagnetism is not thermally activated it, uh, because it's um, unlike the thermal conductivity. So this means that this fluctuating pair density wave does not show up in conductivity, but it can show up in diamagnetism. And there's long been report of large diamagnetism in this uh, region, much about TC and, and high temperature, high magnetic field. And I'll come back to discuss this later. Okay, so now the question is, does Ledger theorem work <clears throat> in this uh, picture? Well, it's an in interesting exercise. Let's consider YBCO. And Ledger theorem, of course, works only for commensurate region, but YBCO fortunately gets to be very close to one, one third. So let's assume three H high sensitivity wave. And from this, we know that the whole concentration is about 8%. Okay, so that means that the electron number for Luttinger count is one minus P, which is 0.92. Now each Bruan zone, this is a three by three unit cell. So each Bruan zone, reduced Bruan zone holds two ninth electrons. If you take 
four of the filled bands, you account for 0.89 electrons. So according to Lutgen's Lutinger, <coughs> we have, you know, we have 0.08 electrons. Then the pocket size um, must contain 3% electrons. Namely, this predicts that the Fermi pocket is 1.5%, which is very close to what is uh, observed experimentally. See, this is the pocket size. It's uh, for this thing is down here. Okay, so let's do the theorem actually works. Okay, uh, in this way. Now, the field band can be thought as field fermionic band. Uh, now, picture is a, is a filled uh, mod insulated band, but uh, it doesn't matter. We're only interested in low energy physics. Now, it's interesting to, to note, uh, this is something I, I, I have to confess, I noticed only yesterday, <clears throat> that if you play the same game, the uh, Lattinger count is strongly violated in the firm liquid star picture. Okay, so remember there were two scenarios. One is this more exotic one where the Fermi surface has area P. And now we can go through the same exercise. Now, the each blue one zone holds 0.22 holes, just as before. But now uh, this has to accommodate, um, um, uh, and we have 0.8 holes. So the electron pocket has to accommodate um, 0.14 fermions. So the size is 7%, okay? 7% is five times too big. So blood to the same is violated basically maximally. <clears throat> so in other words, I, I would say that if you believe that the Fermi pocket has a size P, then with the charge density wave uh, periodicity, you can never get these small pocket. You can never get a single small pocket. Okay, so something has to give. Okay, so that, that's the statement I want to make. Okay, finally, uh, I want to show uh, some very recent data uh, uh, from Sebastian uh, Suchitra, and she gave me permission to, to show this, even though it's not published yet, it's, uh, it's uh, being reviewed. So remember my, my old uh, uh, plot here. Uh, this will be my last slide, actually. Uh, well, not almost my last slide, second last slide um, the, of the phase diagram. So this is this uh, uh, region, which really should be thought of as a quantum vortex liquid, because this is a fluctuating uh, pair density wave, okay? And <clears throat> so, you know, initially people thought that HC2 ends here. So the simulativity should end here. But what she found is that, so, and this is indeed the case, if you go to high temperature, then, uh, then the energy apply magnetic field, then the resistivity goes to zero here and uh, superconductivity ends here. But what she found is that this picture is extremely sensitive to the applied current. If you change the current by 10, uh, by three orders of magnitude from milliamps to microamp, then this phase boundary keeps moving, uh, moving down, okay? So in other words, the simulativity survives actually up to a much higher field than you had thought before. So from this, she made a, uh, they, they made a phase diagram. So previously, the HC plane was like this. This is, uh, think of this as flipped, okay? Uh, the HC plane goes like this. This is your, your, your standard uh, vortex solid uh, phase diagram. But now this guy actually extends up to 45 tesla, and maybe even more. And this is true for all the underdog. Uh, point for three samples that we see. So really somehow, I, well not somehow, but I think experimentally now we have evidence that human activity survives in this uh, up to very high, uh, at low temperature, up to very high field. True sublimate activity, uh, zero resistivity uh, down here, not fluctuating, okay? So in this picture, somehow this, this uh, patterns we managed to get pinned uh, uh, down here, right? So there's some kind of a vortex solid uh, phase um, that lives up here, okay? And this of course is very interesting. And this is actually coincide. There's early evidence uh, for this from um, diamagnetism. Uh, and uh, so what the, 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 the phase diagram may show is this. There's a piece of the phase diagram below about eight degrees that extends up to 40 tesla in that case. And the evidence for this is the onset of uh, irreversibility. So this is usually taken as a signature of a vortex solid phase. So you're going from a vortex solid to a vortex liquid phase and this phase boundary here. So the vortex liquid, vortex solid phase should be a true superconductor. So I think now we have evidence 
very strong evidence that the sumin activity, true sumin activity survives here. And by implication, I think it's likely that we survive everywhere else. So now the question, oh, the other thing I want to mention is that if you look at this, it's the magnitude of this dimensionism, even in this region uh, at high temperature, it's very large, it's six to the times 10 to the minus four. And um, so, so there is fluctuation dimensionism everywhere, I believe. So <clears throat> now of course this leaves open the question, is this human activity still D-wave, an extension of this? Somehow this is much more robust than we thought. Or is this some other kind of human activity? Right? So I think this is the question. Uh, can this picture be tested? So this is my final slide. Uh, so a couple of years ago, uh, uh, I proposed a way of directly measure this, uh, paired susceptibility. And this is based on a paper by Dux Galapino exactly 50 years ago. I, I remember very, vi very vividly reading this uh, when I was a graduate student and I was so impressed by uh, by, by this, that uh, it stuck in my mind for 50 years and it came in handy <clears throat> eventually. So Doug pointed out that, you know, how can you measure a pair-pair correlation function? Uh, you know, for, for spin, spin correlation function, you can do new, neutron scattering, you need to couple it with something, but this is off diagonal. So the only way you can do it is to couple it to another superconductor, right? Uh, to probe it with another superconductor. So he came up with the idea of making a sandwich of the fluctuating superconductor that you want to probe with a uh, conventional or ordered superconductor that you want to probe. And he showed that the, the response function, the correlation, uh, is given by the current. You just measure the current. And the, the current uh, gives you the Fourier transform, the Q and omega dependence. And it's very beautiful that the, the frequency dependence comes from the voltage dependence of your conductivity. And the Q comes from the, uh, and the Q can be gotten by applying a gauge magnetic field, by right, A field. So what you do is that you apply a magnetic field parallel to the, to the sandwich in the plane. And that, as we know, generate a gauge uh, field, which can play the role of, a, uh, of the momentum. So you can put both the momentum and the Q dependence of a pair, uh, uh, of, the, of a fluctuating superconductor. It's an absolutely beautiful idea. So of, of course we want to apply this to our system, right? But then you have a problem because uh, you know this p that we have is one is, is uh, one eighth or one sixth. It's very large, and you don't have enough magnetic field to be able to create this kind of a big momentum. But then uh, it occurred to me that one can play a trick. That nature actually gives us a gift. You see, in the overbuilt. Uh, this is a, a picture of the um, <clears throat> optimally doped uh, of the um, single layer visco. Uh, the, the, pair, the charge density uh, uh, Q has been measured as a function of doping. Actually, this is let, let, let's consider. Uh, oh, let's say that there's a bunch of these doping. Okay. Now, if you look at the uh, so interestingly, the Q is very small. It ranges from one quarter down to about. Uh, um, you know, um, 0.15 or so, okay? If you look at the optimally doped uh, uh, single layer visco, the Q is about 0.15 uh, right here, in this, this cluster, there's a spread, okay? So now if I use this as my probe, so now <clears throat> this thing has a charge density wave with momentum Q naught. <clears throat> we know that if you have a charge density wave coexisting with a D wave semiconductor, then you would induce a pair density wave of this momentum. And that actually has already been directly measured by STM, <clears throat> by um, Hamidian. So now if we use this as an electrode, <clears throat> then this can supply the missing momentum you need to probe a, a pair density wave. So again, in this picture, if I plot the IDV as a function of some magnetic field here, Ordinarily, I would see a peak here like this if there's a pair fluctuation. But now this can be shifted down so I can now probe it, right? So this actually should allow you uh, to probe this directly. Now, the good thing about this uh, optimally doped single layer is that it actually has a very high uh, large gap of about 40, 50 uh, millivolts and very high HC2. So 
this can we can apply a big magnetic field and put the underdog YBCO here. So this actually, in principle, I think, but can allow you to probe uh, this region to probe the pair. You can directly measure the pair fluctuation in this region. That will be very very exciting. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever you find, because it will be able to tell you whether this anomalous thing is coming from a fluctuating conventional D wave or a fluctuating uh, pair density wave. Okay. Um, so this is the end of my yeah, talk. And uh, so my conclusion slide is very simple. Uh, let's go find the other one. Oh, thanks, Patrick, for a very nice talk. So now, is there any question? Patrick, I have a question about your last experiment. Mm -hmm. um, supposing one tried, one made this uh, junction with an optimally doped uh, crystal um, and then one with the pseudo gap. Okay, right. Without the pseudo gap and with the pseudo gap. Okay. Right. Um, because this experiment has been done. Yes. Uh, and so now I'm not applying a magnetic field. Uh, would you expect something to happen showing uh, either a, a change on one side or the other when you try to do? Um, uh, tunneling across to see proximity yeah. effect. So, so this actually was done. Um, get yeah. Corin, uh, it was done by. No, it was done in the nineteen nineties by Lesser in right. France. But uh, what they what what Get saw was that um, it's it's something anomalous. Now, usually you expect to see you know one peak from the fluctuating spectrum, but uh, he saw two peaks. There's a narrow peak sitting on a very broad peak. So we think that they're two lifetimes. So where does it come from? Uh, it suggests that there are two kinds of pairing fluctuation going on there. Uh, the problem with that uh, experiment is that uh, there's a limit to how far you can go right, in temperature. And we didn't apply magnetic, high enough magnetic field. So um, yeah. So I, I think that that's right. Incidentally, this idea of uh, studying superconducting fluctuations in this fashion is actually uh, originally due to Dick Farrell. Oh yes, yeah. I, I, I guess I should have mentioned it. I, I think there is. Uh, I think I think uh, Scalpino's paper mentioned Dick Farrell. I think, but he he is the one who wrote it down uh, in full. I don't think there's a paper from Farrell. Uh, no, there is a paper by Dick Farrell. And uh, Scalapino drew this, drew a figure. Oh, you know, it's, it's very good to uh, draw figures. Yeah. OK. Uh, so we have two people raising their hands. So our columns. So first, uh, the first one is Andre Nivedomoski. So you can ask uh, the question. Yes, um, this is Andre from Rice. Um, you started your talk by summarizing the attempts to understand the change in the Luttinger volume yes. from P to one plus P as you go across P star. Yeah. Um, and then in the bulk of the talk, you talked about the spark pair density weight. So yeah. um, you talked already about how to recover the Luttinger volume, but that was on the left side of the P star. So how should I think of this pair density weight? And how would you recover one plus P on the right hand side? Oh, um, yeah. One plus p is you is is easy, right? If I have a um, uh, if if I have a full Fermi surface, right? My my. So this is beyond the pair density wave disappears, right? There's no pair density, no pair fluctuation, and I just go back to one plus p, right? So that's the easy part. Right now, the difficult part, uh, which which I did not address, is the gap between. So. I think uh, what I can say, yeah, the, the last part of my talk I was focusing on this region. Mm -hmm. And my conclusion is that the conventional Luttinger theorem works here. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this can be explained by one plus P and actually cannot be explained by 
by P. If we assume only charge sensitive, okay, right? Now, I don't know what happens here. Yeah, that's exactly my question. Like, right. how do you Now, within this picture, it would seem more natural for this to be characterized by one plus P, right? Because if this is one plus P, this is one plus P, you know, why would you switch to P in the middle? Okay, but I don't have much more to say on that beyond that. Okay. Okay, thanks. So all I can, all I can say is that here, you know, I can get the backbending too, right? In this region, right? I can get something that looks like that, uh, that would satisfy uh, the emerald, the, the Louis, Louis Tide Fairs emerald. I can satisfy, I mean, the whole effect is, is strange because, you know, it's temperature dependent, it can do a lot of things. Okay. Now, of course, I'm not, I'm staying away from, from the phase transition point. Uh, yeah. Okay, so I don't have much to say, but, but, I, but to, to clarify, um, here I'm saying is one plus P. Thanks. Uh, okay, so the next one is Andrew Chubica. Uh, but there is more question about microscopics, particularly about the slide when you show what you call canted pair density. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, do we have good explanation why pair density wave susceptibility, particularly for this structure, will be larger than conventional D wave uh, susceptibility? In other words, why pairing with the finite Q will be more favorable than pairing with Q equal to zero? Um, well, I mean, I can just make up an uh, excuse because well, that that's went back to our first, uh, first paper for the spin-ons, right? With spin-ons, then I can use this very singular um, gauge fluctuation to give me a, a reason for pairing. But with electron, no, I don't have a good uh, good answer. Now, as I mentioned in the stripe picture, uh, there is a reason, right? In the stripe picture, there's a reason. Uh, as uh, and and numerically, uh, in fact, this was first discovered by numerical. Uh, by by um, by um, by Himeda and, and Ogata, right? So for stripes, um, there's good reason. There's good microscopic reason to believe that there's pair density there. But the kind that I want to talk about, no, I, I cannot claim to uh, to have this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one is lowly. Hey Patrick, nice talk. I have two questions. One about the, yeah, actually in this picture, the order of the magnetic moment you estimated. Is this a moment per unit cell? Are these moments aligned or any parallel to each other? Oh, the magnetic moment, yeah. So, yeah, so I, this is something I didn't talk about much, but turns out that in addition to the charge density wave, there's something called a magnetization density wave. Mm -hmm. which is at a different period in, in this picture, okay? So this is a, oh, which moment are you talking about? Uh, 10 yeah. minus three, 10 minus mm -hmm. three ball magnetron. I'm sorry? 10 to minus three ball oh. magnetron. Oh, okay, so that's a different story. Yeah, that, that is this canted uh, pair density wave. Yeah. yeah, so I think that is, uh, that's per unit cell. Yeah, that's per unit cell. That's a huge moment if you add up everything together. No, no, no. These are the orbital magnetization. This is the uh, intrasite. This is the Chandra's orbital current. So this uh, is so a, it's, it's, it's kind of yeah. They are they are they are like oh, okay. I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Now for your proposal, um, I seem to remember you need a field in plane, right? Now you are having a field along the c-axis. Oh, you mean for the experiment? Right. Yeah. So I guess I now. Uh, you, you can have both or neither, right? But so the in plane field, the job of the in plane field is to supply this um, Q for the Q, right? And uh, even without Q, you may already see some, some, something here, right? So even without in plane field, you, you could, because there's another axis, which is the voltage. So you may already see some fluctuating voltage if this happens to intercept, because, you know, twice this is very close to, you know, uh, Two Q, yeah, uh, you know the um, for for YBCO uh, Q is one third, so Q over two is right here. So you, this guy could be right on top at zero, okay, right? Uh, so 
Uh, this will be an alkyl, you don't need it. Now, uh, so this you can do at zero perpendicular field uh, at finite temperature, right? Okay. Um, but then the problem with finite temperature is that, uh, you know, this TC is only, only uh, 30, 30 degrees, 35 degrees, right? So you have to get an underdope uh, YBCO less than 35 degrees. And that's probably not so good. Yeah. So I think it's better to have a magnetic field, right? So if you can have a magnetic field, you can kill the, the, the underdope cuprates. Suppose you have uh, 30 tesla fields, right? Then you can really kill this, but this is still survive. Right? So I guess my question is, can you do this at high field? Can you go to the magnet? I, I, guess, I, just, I guess, I don't see why not, right? It's just for me, <laughs> you just stick this well, thing I, in. Well, I guess it can be done if temperature is warm enough, but again, when temperature is high, what will happen? Right. You know, see, if you have high field, you can do this at low temperature. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You can. You can go here. So I think actually the most interesting regime is this probe here, right? Right. And then, as you show, right. is a low temperature, right? This region to probe your 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 region. Right. Here. Right. 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 Yeah. And that is Thanks. a high field, and it's not you know it's not ridiculously high. Right? <laughs> <laughs> by today's standard. Oh, all right, thanks. Uh, okay, so the next one is Ivan. Uh, Ivan Bodewick, you, you can ask the question now. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yeah, hear me? yeah. yes, I can okay. even see you. Okay, fantastic talk. Uh, I have a a very quick comment, uh, which is uh, you didn't mention the uh, the you know, shot noise experiment, which I think should be like in the center of your, of your talk, because uh, what it shows is that uh, there are pairs way uh, not just above uh, above uh, you know T C and above T star, but way outside of the energy region, out of the voltage region of what is generally considered a superconducting gap. And unlike uh, uh, RPES and uh, STM, et cetera, these are really quite direct experiments. And the accuracy is uh, very high on along that scale at low temperature uh, along the voltage scale. So there is no other interpretation for that. Um, okay, thank, yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm very glad you, you, you mentioned it. I, I, uh, I was planning, I was going to, uh, Put this in, but I I decided it's just uh, I don't. I'm have just, just I think saying. I that already ran out of time, I don't so I'm very because it's a very nice paper in Nature. By, uh, I don't know whether that proves uh, pair density wave, but what it certainly does prove yeah. is that the pair, yeah. energy scale for the pairs right. is actually much larger than the energy scale of what is called the superconducting gap. Yeah, right. Okay. So the, yeah, the other reason I didn't put it up is that I, I don't want to use this to support my pair density wave picture because it doesn't necessarily support pair density. It could be conventional D wave pair. Uh, okay. The um, other thing is actually a question and maybe maybe hard one. Um, to me, you know, I try to keep eye on the ball. To me, the uh, question of uh, high TC superconductivity is TC. You know, why is T so high? And why it depends in the way it does uh, on the on the doping. So, in the RVB picture that you started from, on the underdope side is really like Bose condensation BC. Yeah. Uh, and you didn't, you know, say that explicitly, but uh, uh, from what you else you have said is that the pair density wave disappear on the overdope side. It goes to Fermi liquid then. Uh, most people would say on the overdub side, it should then become a BCS conventional. So it has to either cross over somehow from one to another, or it has to have a phase transition in between. Um, if we take the Suchitra Sebastian data, uh, uh, if you accept what, what, uh, what you have just shown, uh, then it is consistent with BEC because the uh, coherence length will be smaller than the average distance between the pairs. So there is an overlap between the pairs. So that's consistent with the, with the BC picture. Now the question is what happens on the overdope side? 
And that's where I have the problem because if you look at the way that the TC depends on the, on the superfluid density and the way that superfluid density depends on the temperature, they are perfectly symmetric underdoped to overdoped. So it, to me, looks that physics is the same. That's the question. Yeah, I think there's some long-standing issues about uh, you know from your work on the on the uh, superfluid density on the overdope side, which I think uh, it's not so clear to me. So I, I, yeah, that's one of the issues I think we should uh, clarify. What you know, the initial and uh, my my go. question is uh, about the nature of the superconducting transition in your in your mind, is it BC on the underdoped side and then going to BCS or is it BC everywhere or is it BCS everywhere? Well, it's a crossover question. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think there's a phase transition, right? Um, uh, but um, I think it is certainly BCS. I would say it's BCS like on the overdope side and underdope is, is always complicated. Yeah. Um, it, it is PCS like in the, in the sense that uh, you see a gap, you see a conventional, you know, um, D wave gap. But at the same time, <clears throat> uh, the two delta over KTC is very large. Right? Um, so there are signs that it's not, not like your ordinary BCS. Uh, but I don't think it's all the way over to, um, to a BEC. It could be some intermediate region. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah, by the way, I, you know, Ivan has made these sandwiches 25 years ago. <clears throat> so I really hope that uh, he would make this again. Yeah, we are doing some more. Yeah. Uh, is there any other question? Okay, so if not, let's thank uh, Patrick again. And thank everyone for coming to the talk. Right, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs>